In your bulletins is a sermon handout. You're allowed and welcome to take that out. It is a reflection, a reflection of what we are going to study today and one of my favorite lessons for the season of Easter, this story of Jesus confronting the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, Tiberias after the resurrection. And I love this story. I, you know, if you, if you put a camera in the face of a football player, in particular the star quarterback after the Super Bowl, and he's just won the game with the 30 seconds left in the game, and he's the big hero, they stick the camera in his face and they say, what are you going to do now that you won the Super Bowl? We've heard this so often. What do they say? I'm going to Disney World, right? They get really excited. Well, here's Simon Peter seeing the greatest event in the history of humanity. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, the thing that would transform the entire world. You stick a camera in his face and they say, hey, Peter, what are you going to do? Jesus now rose again from the grave. Oh, I don't know. I think I'll go and fish. But what type of answer is that? That's what Peter does. He's just been witness to this greatest event of all time, and he's going fishing. It's crazy. It seems crazy. But I don't think Peter knows exactly what to do with the resurrected Christ. And so I think that's why this lesson is in our Bible, because Peter had to figure it out. What am I supposed to do with this news that Jesus rose again? And so when we look at our lesson for today, it's really intriguing how this is designed. There are some important things that you need to understand that this lesson is trying to get across to us. The very first thing, it is to prove to us the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For you see, some believed that Jesus was just appearing to them as a ghost. Now I know all of you at some point have lost a loved one that means a lot to you. And you know what it's like when you walk out to the mall and everybody who has a, a vague semblance to them, all of a sudden you see that person everywhere, don't you? You see that person at the foot of your bed and everybody comes to me and says, am I crazy? I thought that person appeared to me last night. I don't think the person's crazy. I think that's just a normal experience in the morning process and I think sometimes those are gifts of God to help you in a time of mourning. But I think that's exactly what most people thought the disciples were going through. A time of mourning, and they're hy hysterical. Who would believe that somebody would raise from the dead? But in this story, this is not just simply a vision, because after all, ghosts don't cook food, do they? And they don't eat with you. And so that's exactly what's taking place here. Jesus is cooking and eating just to prove that he's not simply a ghost, a vision, or a phantom of some sort. He's not a figment of their imagination. He's real, he's alive, he's flesh and blood. Then we go on later in the lesson. It's interesting because once again, they're out all night long. They don't catch any fish. And finally Jesus says, well, throw your net over to the right side and you're going to catch a bunch of fish. And they did. In fact, the Bible actually numbers the number of fish that they caught. How many was that? 153. Oh, not 151, not 158, not 72, 153. There is a significance to that number. We believe that in that day and age, that Jews believed there were, a number of, there were only a total of 153 varieties of fish in the ocean. So there's a theological point that's being made here. That the net of God is meant to catch everybody, not just you and me, not just good Jews, not just Slovaks that are gathered here today, everybody. Now remember, speaking of Slovaks, when I first came here, I actually had a member of the church bring a friend of theirs with me, with them on a Sunday church service, and they said, look, we were hoping we could put an advertisement up for my apartment. And if anybody in your church knows anybody, maybe they could come and rent my apartment. And so I grab it, I look, and I say, oh, sure, they're friends of, of the church. Why not? I'm ready to post this uh, sign on our, our bulletin board. And the person said, oh, I'm so relieved. I mean, after all, we don't want the wrong people in that apartment. And I stopped before I put the, the, put the pin on the uh, bulletin board. I turned around and I said, what do you mean by wrong people? Well, we don't want any black people in there. And I looked at the person and I said, excuse me, are you a bigot? 
He said, oh, no, I might well, confront people with that. Oh, no, I'm not a bigot, but my neighbors may not appreciate that. And I took the piece of paper and I said, I hand it back. I really ticked off our members at that point because this is their friend and I embarrassed them in front of the friend. I handed the piece of paper back and said, in this church, we do not discriminate against people because of the color of their skin or where they come from because God is here to catch all people with the love of Jesus Christ. They didn't like that too much. But am I right? Everybody is supposed to be caught in the net of God, regardless of their creed or nationality or whatever country they might be from. I know one of the most segregated times in our country is Sunday morning at our church services. We still talk about the black church down the street and this white church up here. We are all white here today. We are not all white in our congregation. I thank God for that. Well, no, we're not. We got peers, for goodness sakes. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to point out color. My point is simply this. We should be integrated with all types of peoples because all peoples are to be caught in the net of Jesus Christ. So let's go on. The church is not an exclusive Slovak club. It's not to be a segregated institution but it is to be integrated family of God's people to children. So then we have this interesting confrontation between Peter and Jesus. And Peter comes up to him and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now what is he referring to? These what? You remember, Peter decided after the resurrection to do what? To go fishing. Now you might not believe this, but it is true. Fishermen were really wealthy people. It might have been a stinky, tough job, but they were well-to-do, they were well taken care of, they never starved. Not just because they caught fish, they made a lot of money being fishermen. It was a tough job, but they're one of the wealthiest people in the communities. They always were. And so, uh, Jesus may be referring to the lifestyle. Peter, do you love me more than going fishing? Is your lifestyle more important than me? Or am I more important than your lifestyle? He also could be representing the other disciples. Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples? Do you love me more than life itself? And Peter responds to Jesus, well, of course I love you. Because after all, Jesus, I love you more than anything. I want you to think about that. What happened the last time Peter said this? Do you remember? That's right. The night of the Last Supper... When Jesus was handing out the meal, Jesus then looked at the disciples and said, Hey, one of you are going to betray me. And Peter said, Oh, though all the others betray you, I will always be faithful to you. What did Peter do that night? He denied Jesus three times. Not only did he deny Jesus three times, he did not show up for his friend Jesus, whom he said he loved and would be there to the bitter end. He did not even show up for his friend's desperate time of need at the time of the crucifixion. So he looks at Peter. Peter, do you love me more than these? Three times he asked him. Three times Peter denied him. And so three times Peter once again must confirm his love for Jesus Christ. And so we ask ourselves, why did Jesus ask this of him? And a simple answer to that is because Peter was called to be shepherd of Jesus' sheep. And does Peter love these sheep, love the kingdom of heaven, love Jesus more than his lifestyle? Is he going to ultimately, when he's put to the test a second time, deny Jesus again, or will he be faithful? See, a good shepherd will give their life for the sheep, but Peter needed to be transformed by the touch of Jesus Christ. We know that he was touched and ultimately transformed because of this event. Do you know what happened to Peter at the end of his life? Tradition says that Peter was crucified protect, upside down because he did not want to be uh, associated with the crucifixion of Jesus. He did not feel that he was worthy to be crucified right side up like Jesus was. So he has to be turned upside down to be crucified in that manner because he was not worthy to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. So ultimately, he passed this test, but it was the touch of Jesus Christ, I believe, on this day, after the resurrection, 
that truly transformed his life. Peter did become the good shepherd once he understood the great love that God had for him. But the most important forgiveness he needed to receive was not so much the forgiveness of God, because that was a given in Jesus Christ. He needed to forgive himself. So I'm going to ask you just for a moment, turn your attention to our video screen. We have a wonderful video, just about a three-minute video, that really will touch your life to dramatize this event and the touch of Jesus Christ on Peter's life and what transformed him. Do you understand the great love that God has for you? There may be other people in this world that aren't willing to forgive you, but the love and the forgiveness of our Heavenly Father is a given because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so the real question you need to ask is, are you willing to forgive yourself for whatever it is you think you've done that's so awful, that separated you from God? Because in God's perspective, that slate is wiped clean. You are free of that burden today. So I'm inviting you to do something spectacular, <laughs> to forgive yourself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Peter. And we know that because of what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago on that cross and in that resurrection gave to us the forgiveness and the love of God. That is a given. But God, we have such a hard time letting go of all of those faults and all of those warts. We have such a hard time forgiving ourselves. Well, if the Almighty God can forgive us then there's absolutely no reason why we cannot forgive ourselves. We ask you to free your children today from all of their burden and all of their guilts and all of those things that weigh them down. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.